Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening, downloading, and subscribing to the latest edition of the 12 Kyle podcast. I'm 12 Kyle. Check this out. On this podcast, we're going to talk about growing old with hip hop. Now, when I say growing old, I'm not trying to say that you're old, even though some of you are, (laughs) but what I want to kind of convey is a message of, you know, this is a growing genre and it's a genre that's ever changing. And keep in mind, hip hop was birthed in 1973. So it's not even 50 years old. It's still new. It's still changing. It's still within, you know, the first and second generations of it. With that being said, hip hop grows and we as people, we as fans grow old or older with the music that we grew up on. Um, As many of you know, if you've been following this podcast, you know that I am a huge hip hop fan. I mean, I think that goes without saying, (laughs) but I'll say it to, you know, those who don't know. I'm a huge hip hop fan and I've watched this genre grow um, from something that, you know, people thought would be a fad that, you know, something that would just come and go, something that was just strictly in the neighborhoods, strictly people standing on the corner, um, to, you know, a multi-billion dollar industry. And it's funny when I think about it, because, uh, especially in the eighties, people associated hip hop. Well, they didn't call it hip hop. Then it was called rap. <laughs> they, associ- they associated rap with breaking, breakdancing. So they figured it to be a fad. Uh, they figured that breakdancing was a fad. Uh, rap would be a fad just like disco. You know, truth be told, disco wasn't around that long. It only lasted for a few years. It seemed like it was a lot longer than that, but it really wasn't. Um, but disco had their era in the 70s. And, um, you know, much was thought to be the same for rap. Uh, people didn't think it was going to stick around. And I remember, you know, seeing rap and rappers, you know, getting their first airplay on MTV and getting a Grammy and that type of thing like that being nationally and worldwide accepted. You know, it's funny to me, the genre that, you know, at one point in time, and I remember it vividly, that would only get airplay on radio stations after 12 midnight you know now you could be watching a basketball game in salt lake city and they're playing biggie as the point guard is dribbling the ball up the court i mean biggie (laughs) in salt lake city who would have ever thought but yeah it's come a long way and the one thing i think that we kind of lose sight of is that as we grow and we evolve as fans you know, the genre does the same. So as you get older in hip hop, you know, there's some things that you may or may not recognize over a period of time. And some of the ideas and I, I guess, ideology uh, that once stood in hip hop, you know, over a period of time, you know, things have changed. Obviously, when you get money involved, that changes everything. I mean, no, Curtis Blow, Run DMC, LL, acts like that. They did not get into rap to make money. You know, it wasn't until like the 90s where cats were really figuring out, okay, hey, not only can I rhyme and I can show you that I can rhyme and show you how dope I am, but I can make some bread with this too. And, you know, prior to that, we had not seen rappers get to the point of them you know, being financially well off to the point where they could actually retire from rapping. That was a world that we knew nothing of. I mean, you look at a guy like Jay-Z, who is, quote unquote, hip hop's first billionaire, according to Forbes magazine. He's worth a billion dollars. I mean, like that in most hip hop fans eyes we could have never envisioned that happening, but it has. And 
you know, again, there was a changing of the guards. There was uh, a shift in the culture uh, and then music and everything around the music changed and it went through periods. We talk about hip hop's golden era, the silver era, the bronze era and, you know, (laughs) the microwave era. And even in all of that, you can still find dope artists. You can still find dope lyrics. You can still find dope songs. You can still find dope albums. But I'm going to be honest, you know, things really change. And I I say this all the time. Things really changed in the early 2000s with the advent of the Internet. Um, And the music industry and the rap industry in particular uh, really fell behind. And they have yet to catch up. Uh, The Internet made things so, so accessible. Uh, It's funny because I was talking to some of our friends the other day and we were talking about how in the early 2000s with the advent of um, sharing sites, uh, sites like uh, LimeWire, um, Napster, uh, Kazaa, People stopped buying albums <laughs> because the mentality came like, why should I pay $10 for an album at Best Buy when I can go find this same album online for free? That didn't make any sense. I mean, like, why should I do that? That didn't make any sense for me to spend that kind of money. Now, of course, it's being, the music was being pirated because if I had Jay-Z's I don't know, let's say his um, volume two album on my computer and I'm logged into Napster. All someone has to do is if Kevin lives in D.C. and he wants to download that album, all he has to do is log in a LimeWire. I'm mean, excuse me, log in a Napster. And once he's once he sees it, he would just be able to log in and download it from my computer. It's just that simple. And file sharing and music sharing at that point was at an all time high. I'll be honest. I got to the point where not only did I stop buying albums, I was investing in blank CDs. (laughs) And the reason why I got into blank CDs was because, Hey, why go buy a Jay-Z album when I could download it off the internet, burn it to a blank CD And I got Jay-Z CD and I didn't even have to leave my crib. (laughs) And to be honest, uh, that was the first wave of free music. Now, of course, it wasn't free because, again, it was pirated. Uh, Technically, we were stealing. Uh, I call it acquiring music through secondary marketing. But the statute of limitations are up. So, I mean, I'm not going to incriminate myself on this podcast. And when I say I got Jay-Z's album, I'm using that as an example. (laughs) I'm not about to snitch on myself, but I think myself included and a lot of other people, that's how we got a lot of our music. You know, it was through, you know, those sites. And again, those sites were not legal and the artists saw no money from, you know, those transactions. And ultimately, neither did the labels. And so it got us in a a position where as fans, we were used to getting music and albums for free and not having to leave our house and not having to pay for anything. And so, again, the music industry fell behind and they just not they just couldn't catch up. And to be honest, they've still been they're still behind. Now, they're not as far behind as they once were, but they're behind. And so. You fast forward to, you know, today and what's going on in music now, you know, you have these sites where everybody's album is on the site. And, you know, these are services that, you know, allow you to listen to the music, you know, and I'm talking about iTunes, uh, Spotify, uh, Tidal, those type uh, where, you know, I don't necessarily have the physical copy of you know, the Wu-Tang catalog, but I can click a button. And because I, I'm on Spotify, I can listen to the whole Wu-Tang catalog without leaving my house. You know, it's the same thing. Now, I pay a monthly fee to Spotify, but you have to ask yourself, you know, 
of the nine ninety nine that I pay a month to Spotify, you know, how much per listen is the artist actually getting? And, you know, they talk about streams. So my question is, what is the stream? You know, how many streams equal a sale? And I'm pretty sure, you know, someone out there can look it up. But I don't know that we've got a definitive answer from most record companies anyway, because the numbers tend to be inflated and the numbers tend to vary just really depending on who you ask. So, you know, even in this day and time, honestly, I cannot tell you what a stream is. I know what it is. But I can't tell you what a stream is. I don't know what to equate to a stream. Like, so if Drake's new album comes out tomorrow and we listen to it and he has a million streams, you know, so what does that mean? What how much money does he make per stream? And I'm pretty sure Drake is going to get a different amount of money than, you know, I don't know. Uh, who who can I think of? Uh, let's say. Uh, give me a rapper. <laughs> uh, uh, Childish Gambino. He's probably going to get more than him. Um, so it just really depends. And again, I think this is the record company's way of kind of taking some of that power back. But ultimately, the artists still suffer. I mean, and I'll give you an example. Like I remember in the 90s, uh, you know, it was really big. One of the big things were, especially with hip hop, was your first week sales. Like you had to crush it first week sales. Like if you didn't do 200, 250, 300,000, then, you know, that really dictated and really was going to be the barometer for whether or not, you know, how many singles got pushed, how many videos got done, because you needed to come out of the gate, you know, smoking. I mean, if you sold 100,000 your first week, that was <laughs> that was considered to be a flop. <laughs> so, you know, I remember, you know, artists coming out selling 250, 300,000 in the first week and people are like, "Uh, oh, the numbers weren't so good." <laughs> and, you know, but nowadays you fast forward to now, uh, you know, I think if you have 170, 175,000 in the first week, that's a great first week, which again in the 90s you know, they'd be looking at like, I mean, depending on the artist, if you sold 175 in the first week, you might get dropped. It was just that serious. So we still haven't figured out what's a stream and how many streams equal a sale. And at the rate that they're going, I don't know that we ever will, because the record companies really aren't going to come up off the language and tell us it, it, it what's really, really going on now. The next thing, and I know it's, <laughs> I know it's, uh, it's a play on words, but projects versus albums, probably over the last, I want to say 10, maybe 15 years, you hear a lot of people referring to albums as projects. And, and again, I don't want to cast any shade on anybody because I just don't. Um, and I know like, uh, my man, shout out to, uh, Sid Davis over at the social introvert, um, podcast, listen to him weekly. I mean, Sid, he refers to albums as projects all the time. My boys are dead in hip hop. Shout out to those cats. Uh, they refer to albums as projects as well. I don't. And again, there's no knock on them because those are my boys and Sid got it. I listen to each week. And love his podcast. Um, I can't bring myself to calling an album a project. And I know it's semantics, but the reason being a project sounds like it's just something that's just there. Right. Like when you say something is a project, it's something that's in my mind, something that's temporary. An album is something that, you know, is solid it's something that's here to stay a project kind of reminds me of the you know science project that you did back in the sixth grade you spent weeks and weeks and weeks preparing it you do this presentation people come around they check it out and then they leave they give you a prize if you win and then they move on to the next thing and to be honest that's what today's hip-hop is and so when you're growing old with hip-hop you wonder 
how did it go from albums to projects? And, and it's not, again, I'm not even knocking those who call albums projects because I've heard several, in fact, most artists refer to their music, most current artists refer to their music as projects. And I think, again, while it's a play on words and you might think it's semantics, I think there's something here. And the reason being is because it gives off the connotation that this is just something that I put together and it's here for you to see. You can check it out. And then once it's done, once you're done checking it out, you move on to the next thing. And really, from where I stand, that's today's hip hop in a nutshell. That really is where it is. I mean, like, it's just there. You know, there's this build up and there's well, <laughs> well sometimes there's a build up. Sometimes it's not a build up. There's this build up about this particular album that's coming. The album comes. You put it on display. It's there. You know, there's a rush for everybody to listen to it. Everybody listens to it, you know, two or three times. And then it's like, oh, OK, yeah, that's pretty good. Oh, that's hot. That's that's dope. Oh, yeah. When's the next album coming out? Huh? I mean, when there was a time in hip hop where albums were created, you know, your favorite app or your favorite artist might not drop an album. He, he or she might drop an album once every three or four years. You know, some drop within two years, but it was rare for you to drop an album within two years of the previous album. Um, but in the microwave era that we're in, you know, people have to kind of stay relevant. So if you're not doing stuff heavily on social media and you're not <laughs> if you're not beefing with your fellow rapper, then, you know, some people have to do certain things to stay relevant and stay in the public eye. But no, I mean, like back in the day, you know, and again, I know it's different days and time, but no, Run DMC wasn't going to make an album. And then, you know, in, in, in 2018 and then follow up that album in 2019 and then have another album in 2020. It's just it's just no. You have to give your artists a chance to miss you. I mean, excuse me, your fans a chance to miss you. You see what I'm saying? I mean, like it's, but that's the difference between an album and a project because I'll put it like this, right? If your fa- if you knew that your favorite artist was going to drop an album in 2020, and then they said, "Well, look, my album's coming in 2020. It's now 2019. I'm going to drop an album in 2020." And my follow up to that album won't come out until 2024. Oh, the anticipation is going to be crazy for that 2020 album. But also the artist is going to spend a lot more time, I think, to develop that album, to make sure that it's going to, you know, it's going to hold you over, not just fill you up, but it's also going to hold you over. It's like it's almost like a good steak. It's like a good steak. Like you want to sit, you want to eat it, you want to taste it, but you also want to savor it too as well. And honestly, it's not a lot of savoring going on. And you notice that when you grow older with hip hop, you know, it the the savoring of the albums is just not there anymore. And don't get me wrong, I don't want to paint the picture as if I don't listen to current music and current albums. I do. Some depending on the artist, I can't I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I listen to everybody's album Every time it comes out, I don't. But some of the current artists that I respect and I like, yeah, I definitely listen to their albums. However, it's not many artists or not many albums that I've heard over the last 10 years where I'm like, damn, I got to go back to that because it was just that good. It's just not. I mean, like, it's good for the time in which it was. And yeah, it set Twitter ablaze and social media ablaze for like two weeks. And then after that, uh, it's back to whenever. Case in point, what what think about right now the dopest album that you've heard this year? Just and just say it to yourself. <laughs> Whatever the dopest album this that you've heard this year, you've probably listened to it. And let's say it was in the beginning part of the year and this is the middle part of the year. You probably haven't gone back and listened to it. 
it's the microwave era. It's it's only hot for the it's just like anything you put in a microwave. It's hot for a while and then it cools off. And that's the difference between, you know, the albums and projects. And I think what's happening is, you know, people are more concerned with putting out projects. Nobody wants to do albums anymore. And that's unfortunate. Also in this era, you have to understand, too, that how music is consumed. And that goes back to what I was talking about a little earlier um, with the free music. You know, in the microwave era, it's really about two weeks. You know, an album will come out and people will be all over it and it'll be the buzz for two weeks. And then it's on to the next thing. Like I heard, I saw somebody on Twitter the other day talking about like, yo, so many albums come out. It's just hard for me to get up to to listen to them all. And honestly, it's not. But because you are conditioned to listen to and consume so much music that you really, again, don't give yourself a chance to savor how great the music is. Because once you listen to it, you put it to the side. For a person like me who's tenured in hip hop and who's grown older with hip hop, no, I still go back to the older albums. I still go back to the classics. I still go back to stuff that rocked 10 years ago. I still go back to stuff that rocked 25 years ago. And what's great about a lot of those albums is I hear something different every time that I listen to it. And to be honest, when you're consuming music, that's how it should be. Honestly. You should hear something different each and every time that you've. And it doesn't matter if you've heard this album a hundred times. If you're listening and if it's dope, you should be able to hear something new, something that you. It could be a snare. It could be a, a clap that you didn't hear before, but you should be able to get something different from it. But again, music is consumed so much. And it's not to say that music wasn't consumed at a high volume in the 90s because it was. We did. We we did just that. The difference was, was that there was never a situation where, or at least I can't remember, there was a situation where you listen to your favorite artist, you heard his album, and then you're like, damn, when's the next album coming out? No, it don't work like that because you know that it's going to be a while before your favorite artist drops again. So you're going to pick up that steak, you're going to bite into it, you're going to chew it, you're going to taste all the juices, and you're going to savor it. And you're going to eat it until it gets to the last crumb and then you'll try to find something else. But you don't move on as fast because you know that something's not coming right down the pipe for, from the same artist. And then the other thing is, you know, I think people have gotten really consumed with hip hop fans in particular, have gotten really consumed with playlists. And so your playlist really has change the complexity of the albums or how it sounds because and I blame hip hop fans for this because toward the mid to late 90s particularly in the later 90s going into the 2000s we as hip hop fans we we started letting artists off the hook for putting out bullshit music and we would kind of justify it by saying okay well yeah I like five tracks but he gave you 15 <laughs> If he gave you 15 tracks and you only like five, that album sucks. But in the streaming era or in the playlist era, you know, you can take those five tracks from, let's say you could take five tracks from Drake. You can take five tracks from the, your five of your favorite tracks from uh, Wayne. You can take three tracks from uh, Gucci Mane. (laughs) You could take another seven tracks from the latest uh, Rick Ross album. That's your playlist. Now, you're not consuming all of these artists catalog, but that's your playlist. And to be honest, the casual rap fan or hip hop fan is perfectly fine with that. And that's where I think, like I said earlier, where some of the ideology we've lost, because honestly, as a hip hop fan, we're not supposed to let our hip hop artists get off the hook with giving us bullshit but it seems like we're being you know we consume so much music that we almost figure that you know 
they're going to drop at least three or four duds. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, the expectations are low. So I guess. And that's what kind of makes it seem like people are more consumed with getting a playlist instead of a full album. And the other thing I, I think, at least my and this is just my personal frustration, is there are way too many guest features on these albums. A lot of the albums that I listen to today, there are way too many guest features. And I get it. You know, yeah, you want to bond with people. You want to kick with people and, and you like making music. I get it. But because of technology, no, in the 90s and the 80s, you didn't have it. You know, if. If Run DMC was on LL's song, Run DMC was actually in the studio with LL. You know, now if Bun B wants to get on the track with Rick Ross, he can just, you know, record his verse, email it to him, and they'll put it in. They don't ever have to meet. And there's nothing wrong with that. I like features, but I don't listen to your album to see who's on, to see who else is on your album. I'm listening to the album because I like you. You know, <laughs> if I like Drake, that's dope. But I'm not listening to Drake just to hear him spit with, you know, the locks and Jay-Z. No. Now, don't get me wrong. If, I, if I'm listening to a Drake album, yeah, a feature here or there, that's fine. But if you've got 17 tracks and 10 of them have guest features, it ain't your album. Guess what it is? Compilation. That's what it is. It's a compilation. And so I think it's been a disservice to hip hop fans, particularly as you grow older, that you've spoon fed the fans music with features. And in a lot of ways, that's done because either one, you're not confident in being able to carry an album yourself or two, you're just succumbing to the pressure. Like, I, I remember a lot of people giving J. Cole a lot of flack for, you know, not having any guest features on his album. Guess what? He ain't supposed to have guest features on his album. <laughs> you dummies. It's a J. Cole album. It ain't J. Cole and Friends. <laughs> and I mean, like, people were really criticizing J. Cole for having not having any guest features. He ain't supposed to. Just like I remember uh, Kendrick Lamar dropped... Um, uh, to Pimp Butterfly, which is one of my favorite albums. And people were mad because he only had one guest feature, and that was Rhapsody. Well, I mean, to me, that tells me Kendrick Lamar thinks very highly of Rhapsody. If he bypassed all of these other people, people in his camp, and he said, look, I'm going to get Rhapsody on one track. That's it. And to be honest, that's how it's supposed to be. We're not tuning into your album to hear the compilation. If we wanted a compilation, we check for DJ Khaled. The next thing I have, um, you don't really have a lot of development from the the record label. And I, and I get the reason why is because, to be honest, there really aren't a lot of record labels. Um, you know, we came up in an era where, uh, you know, there were tons and tons of record labels and a lot of them you know, fell by the wayside and, and, and fell through, you know, during that digital era where they just couldn't keep up with technology. And so I get it. And right now, no, you don't necessarily need a record label to, you know, succeed in the music business because, hey, all you need is, you know, a computer. You you could, I literally could make a song, put it on my soundtrack, excuse me, my SoundCloud page and, you know, make it a record. And the next thing I know, you know, I'm Old Town Road. <laughs> and that's no shot at Lil Nas X, but I mean, I'm just, I'm giving you the, the example. So it's like, it's not that hard. So in this digital age, the record label isn't necessarily as needed as this once was. You know, sad but true. It's just not needed. So I get it, but. I kind of harken back to that time because even though record labels were doing artists dirty and I really applaud these hip hop artists 
who have followed the trend and followed, you know, the blueprints that a lot of their um, predecessors have set forth. Guys like Puffy, guys like, you know, uh, Master P, guys like uh, Russell Simmons, um, getting their own, you know, owning their own masters like a, a Nipsey Hussle. Rest in peace. I applaud people like that. And, and I understand, too, that, you know, because you don't have the labels like they once were. So you're not going to have the artist development because trust me, no matter what you thought about Def Jam in 1985, Def Jam was there and they were determined to cultivate their artists. They were going to make sure that they they didn't want to just, you know, and they told LL Cool J, look, we don't want to, we don't want you just to have the hottest record in New York city. We don't want you just to have the hottest record in the country. We want to make sure that you have hit records and a solid foundation for years and years and years and years. They wanted to develop him. And I mean, like we saw that in, you know, R&B where artists would be developed by their record label. You know, in hip hop, there was a time when that was a concern and that was a there was a uh, an effort to do so. Not so much as now, because now. Even though I'm on the outside looking in, it looks like the record labels are, you know, they want the next hit and that's it. And that's cool. But when you have these hits and you have this run, what happens when the hits and the runs stop? Because everybody can't be on top forever. That's just the bottom line. I mean, say what you want about Cardi B. I'm not a fan of Cardi B or her music, but she's hot, you know, and she's on top. God bless her. The only advice I would give Cardi B, save your money. Because at some point, the hits and the fame and the notoriety is going to run out. And and that time frame is going to be shorter for someone like her because there is no artistic development. And then, you know, I I understand it. You want to get in, you want to get your money and you want to do other things. You want to act. You want to, you know, I don't know, be in plays, whatever the case may be. I get it. You want to do endorsements. That's all fine and good, but the base of what you're trying to do started with music. You know, I harken back to Jay Z. You know, when you look at the breakdown of his fortune, only a small percentage of his fortune is based off of rap. You know, and that's interesting because that's how we know Jay Z. But he got in the game and he moved around and started doing different things. And I guess, and, and again, I'm not knocking anybody for doing it, but. The industry isn't interested in developing artists anymore. It's just not. It's just not. And the sooner that the artists figure that out, the better off they are. (laughs) Lastly, the one thing I want people to understand, too, about growing old in hip hop is that there's no such thing as being too old for hip hop. Right. Um, When you're tenured in hip hop like me. (laughs) Uh, you've seen a lot and I hear a lot. And the one thing I've always maintained is that, and I talked about this on, I know I talked about it on the podcast with uh, Eclectic. Um, Rap, hip hop is the only genre that'll tell you that you're too old to be in it, right? The Rolling Stones, Mick Jagger, those dudes like 85 years old. Mick Jagger is 125 years old and nobody's telling the Rolling Stones when they go on tour and they're drunk and they're high and they're on stage falling down, all kind of crazy stuff. Nobody tells them that they're too old to be out there. You can go to Essence Festival in New Orleans every summer. You will see Mays and Frankie Beverly. Mays and Frankie Beverly are about 106 years old and I love them, love their music. But nobody's telling them to sit down. But you trot out Karras one. Oh man, what's this old ass doing up there? These old heads. Come on, man. If you're growing old with hip hop, you're gonna be just that. Old. Even at some point, even though it doesn't feel like it, you're gonna get old. <laughs> because I remember a 13-year-old kid. Sitting in his bedroom, listening to fuck the police. 
that 13 year old kid was me and no i would not have ever thought that hip-hop would come this far but it has and then you look around and one of the things that's become evident to me is that hey man there's no such thing as being too old for hip-hop look at jay-z jay-z's like 50 years old and you can make a case that he's the or one of the best rappers right now personally i don't think so but (laughs) but he's still great right he's in my top five you look at a guy like black thought black thought i think lyrically probably that there might not be a better mc right now lyrically than black thought and he's dropping solo albums left and right finally outside of the roots and it seems to me that most of the dope MCs are 35 plus, 40 plus. That's saying a lot. And I know, I know it's a young man's game. Let's just, I mean, I'm going to keep it a bean with you. That's what it is. Hip hop always has, always will be a young man's sport. And rightfully so. But when you're growing older with hip hop, you understand that as time change, people change what you used to listen to might not tickle your ear as much as it did once before. Oh yeah, sure. I'll listen to fuck the police right now. I might even listen to two live crew, two albums that, you know, I love listening to when I was a teenager, but the energy ain't the same. And so, yeah, for you, 22 year old, who's listening to the Migos when you're 42, Energy won't be the same. Hip hop will still be around. But that's a part of growing older with hip hop. You see things for how they are and see things as to how they change. And, you know, it's like the old saying, the more things change, the more they stay the same. But the one thing that you have to do is as you're getting older, also develop appreciation for it. Because in the end, although it hadn't been around that long, technically speaking, if you don't preserve it, it could easily go away. That's going to do it for me. Thanks for checking out the latest edition of the 12 Kyle podcast. I'm your boy, 12 Kyle. I'll catch you guys next time. Five G's.